Welcome to another episode of Spaghetti at My House. On today's episode, we have Richard Skaggs. Welcome to the Spaghetti at My House. Yeah, yeah. dude. Hey, do you, you got your bowl of spaghetti? Yeah, you got to show the spaghetti. Oh, oh man. Here we go. Look, I'm a thumbnail right here. Ooh, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So, so what's up with your chef coat? I just came from work. Oh, okay. What's the last thing you baked? Uh, the last thing I baked was actually for Becky's birthday today, which is one of my friends. I made her a coconut sable tart, and I did a coconut sable pastry crust, and then I filled it with a coconut pastry cream and topped it with an emulsified butter lemon curd and toasted Swiss meringue and I'm an avid gardener too, so I went out and got all of my beautiful like edible flowers and garnished it with those as well. So Wow, well, so you have wait. you have all this like in your garden already, like the edible flowers? Yeah, I, I have a 45 foot garden by 27 feet and there's a greenhouse on it. So I grow a lot of my own stuff for my baking and my cooking. Ooh, that's Look something we could research. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. Mm hmm What kind of, you said it's coconut, and there was some, a word I heard that I never know. Emulsifier? I, no, yeah. I know what an emulsifier is, but no, what, you said the flavor? <laughs> oh, a sable? Yeah, what is, what is that? So sable is French for the word, it means sandy, so whenever you eat the crust um, on this tart, it should pretty much dissolve, and you should just be left with like a buttery, sandy texture. Yeah, and I'm trying As to have to... something kind of crisp and crunchy. Ooh, we should get in to have dessert for us after we eat this spaghetti. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good idea. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but man, man so the last time I baked was today. <laughs> you baking all this awesome stuff, like, did you happen to go to, like, a pastry school or, like, a cooking school? Or is this just all on your own that you know how to do all this? So... I went to college for medical technology with a minor in forensic science, <laughs> and I tried all of that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I got about, I, I have a semester in that degree left to finish, but I'm not going to finish it. So I wasted all of my money on that that was given to me for college, and I didn't want to go into debt. So I, I had two plans when I was younger. Either I was going to be a scientist and work on crime scenes, or I was going to be a chef, and I should have went with the second option because I have, I've been cooking forever. So I taught myself, I guess this is a long explanation to your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I started with cupcakes, and then, you know, we all have to find out what we are and where we've been and, like, <laughs> you know, what our ethnicity is. And I found out that part of my family is actually from Bordeaux, France. And I was like, okay, I have a connection to the French cooking thing. And that's kind of what started the French side of my baking. And when I first started out, it was cupcakes because cupcake wars was like the thing, you know, okay. it was in its, you know, prime. <laughs> you can figure out the uh, icing splatter analysis because of your uh, medical background, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. This right here tells me that this cake was slashed just wrapped this way. <laughs> and over here, over here, that's what she did it. Miss Crumpet was always jealous. But, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> it worked. That it's re it really wasn't that crazy of a jump from medical to pastry just because, like, it's kind of crazy, but I view pastry chefs as being like slaves to recipes because everything has to be exactly measured. Everything has to be on point all the time for a recipe to come out perfectly and consistently. That's why, you know, everything's done by weight. But if you're a chef and you forget salt in the soup, you can just add salt. I can't unbake um, a cake, you know. Right. <laughs> so, and, you know, the science field is pretty much the same way. You have to follow exact you know formulas to get the outcomes correctly so it's not a crazy jump from you know to me from science to pastry because it makes sense in my mind it, it's a formula that i have to follow and this is what i get and i i enjoy that all right all right 
So I know that you were a former baker at Cafe 1217. Uh-huh. So that's when I lived in Arkansas. Okay. And that was my first serious, like, gourmet cooking job. And the woman who ran it, she was a hard ass, but in the best way possible. I have a mouthful of spaghetti. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you you got to gotta talk like that, sir. It, I know. <laughs> I have to remember right now I'm not the princess, you know. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, when I first had moved to Hot Springs, Arkansas, I was working four jobs. <laughs> Dude, I would yeah. Get up, yeah, and Cafe 1217 was the fourth job from that. But I worked with a woman named Mary Claire who helped me hone my macaron skills. That was her whole thing. I worked at a place called Fat Bottom Girls, which was featured on Cupcake Wars. And I also worked at a, um, it's in an old bathhouse, so it's in the historic district of uh, Hot Springs, but it was a brewery. That's what they turned it into, and there was a gelato Ria in there, so I made gelato as well as the baked goods for them. Oh, wow. And then Cafe 1217 was like gourmet, European, elevated style food. And I was just trying to get as much culinary experience as I could. And Cafe 1217 was the longest one that I had there. That's where I learned, you know, layered cakes and tarts and pies and shoe paste. And that's what really started sparking like, oh, I'm going to make all the good things. <laughs> so when I started working there, I could not make a pie, like to save my life. It was, it was bad. I was like, crust is evil. Pies are dumb. And then she's like, no, you're doing it wrong. Let me show you. And I needed like that, that almost positive negative reinforcement, like stop being a dumb beep. But, you know, <laughs> so, and, you know, I'm pretty grateful to her for like the opportunity she gave me. That's like, that's where I started learning the foundation to French pastry, just because we did shoe paste, we did creme brulee, we did these elevated layer cakes, there was mousse, I had to make genoise, it was crazy, so. Wow. It, it was like what the catalyst almost that was like, okay, you need to branch out and stop doing cupcakes, essentially. Yeah. yeah. It was what a good is, time. What is genoise? Is that what it is, right? Genoise? Is that what you said? Yeah. Genoise is a sponge cake that doesn't have any chemical leaveners in it, like baking soda and baking powder. It relies heavily on whipped egg whites um, for its fluffy texture. And that's like one of the foundations to French pastry. It's how you make your opera cakes or your roulades or anything like that. So it's like one of the basic things you got to know. <laughs> wow. All right. So, and so working at... Um, Cafe 1217, what, <clears throat> what gave you that, that drive to really stay working there and um, really, like, want to continue with the baking? <clears throat> so, at this point, I had wasted, you know, three years of my life in a career field, and, like, I, cooking is very personal for me, baking in general, because, like, that's how you show people that you care and, you know, you invite them in and you bake them a meal or you, you know, cook them a meal, whichever. And it's just something that's so personal. And I had a drive to want to learn more. I wanted to perfect and craft my skill, even if I might have not gotten along with everybody there and there was differences to be had. I needed to get better. And that was the best environment and the place I was at to get to that point. So I was like, you got to, you got to do the grind, go cry in the walk-in, and then we're going to make some creme brulee. So, <laughs> you know, I yeah. just like, I don't like, I have a, I have a huge fear of being a failure, I guess is what it comes from. So I have to be successful in what I do. And that's where a lot of my drive comes from. But I also bake pretty much every day, so I don't ever feel like I'm working. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so it's crazy. how did the <laughs> transition from your medical degree into, like, your interest in baking get started? Like, you, you know, because you, you're going to school for this medical degree, and then all of a sudden you're just like, you know, well, I think I have a different calling. How did that work? Like, what happened? Um... <laughs> Oh, here we go. <laughs> so 
So in college, you know, I've always been a pretty good student. I do what I'm supposed to. But in college, when I had my sense of freedom, it annoyed the crap out of me that in every single one of these science classes that I had to take, it was an overview of every other science class I've had to take. So I started skipping classes and only going to classes that I thought were worth my time. So I started not doing too well. Okay. And then my act got changed and then I turned 21 and it went <laughs> out the window. <laughs> so uh, tattoos were more important, college tuition and drinking was more important. And I got involved with, you know, drugs and everything. And then I was like, you wanna what? Your life's going downhill, let's quit. Go back home and, you know, reevaluate where you want to be and what you want to do with your life because you have to do it every day. So my mom and I sat down and wrote out a list of everything that I thought I was good at. Eating, cooking, baking, all on the good side. Uh -huh. Math, you know, all these other things that I just hated doing that was involved with my actual career that I was trying to pursue in college. I didn't like any of it and everything that I liked was in the culinary field. So I was like, this is what I need to be doing. So I started teaching myself how to bake cupcakes. And then I got my first job at a place called Mad Hatters. And I was there for a while and eventually, you know, became her manager. And all we did was cupcakes. So, and then oh, wow. that's kind of like how the transition happened. I worked at one grocery store in between that transition. <laughs> and then... <laughs> It's been baking and pastry arts and the culinary world ever since. Wow. Wow. Who, uh, yeah. who pushed you towards medical in the first place, do you think? I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, the subjects I was good in school were music and science. So, and I know the culinary world is really competitive. So... And that scared me a lot. And I didn't want to be in a high stress situation like that all the time. Yeah. So I was like, do the science thing. People will leave you alone in a lab with a microscope. And I'm like, that sounds great. Right. It was not. <laughs> <laughs> For anybody that doesn't know that you were on a Netflix episode. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. <laughs> tell me tell me about the um, about the Netflix show experience man like what was it like well it was really fun the people that make those shows happen go through a lot a lot of work to make them happen um the interviewing process was a little bit crazy for me because they contacted me and my friend Chris and I were like let's do this thing because he and I had just competed in um a chocolate and sugar sculpture competition um, in Houston and we got third place and we're like we work really well together and we've been working together since I worked at Cafe Dijon like four five yeah four years ago <laughs> um, so we were like let's do this because he and I both had auditioned before for the Food Network to try and get on one of the baking championships so we were like let's see what happens if we audition together and we ended up getting on the show it took like I want to say four or five months for us to actually find out and we did you know a couple of interviews and had questions here and there and then just one day they're like congratulations and we were like oh my god we leave in a month we have so, much <laughs> so yeah. um there was a lot of planning and a lot of testing and a lot of we don't know what they might throw at us kind of thing so we were preparing for everything and then they fly you out there and they feed you and pitch you up and it was great. It was like right. the whole celebrity treatment. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, the day of the competition was really hectic though. And I was like, they're like, you'll probably be here till midnight. And I'm like, it's 5 a.m. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, they do this thing called false starting and it's just like so everybody kind of gets rid of those loose nervous jitteries before you know you really start the show so they have you do several false starts and then they're they look you dead in your very tired eyes because you're like i went to sleep five hours ago why are we up <laughs> <laughs> 
so but uh once the actual competition started, it was like, let's do this. Um, yeah. We were on a Christmas episode. So we were the first episode on Sugar Rush Holiday. And our theme was Christmas Spirit. And that was either involved with booze or like the traditional Christmassy things that, you know, can come from there. So Chris and I had everything figured out. And, you know, we, we were kind of poking fun at some people because they were like, oh, I brought my spatula from home. I brought this from my house. And it's like, why? It's all here. And then <laughs> you use somebody else's equipment. You're like, oh, oh, this feels weird. So I'm like, I get yeah. it. It's like, you know, when you drive somebody else's car, it feels weird because it's not yours. It, right. That's like the best way I can describe that. Right. So, but we made it all the way to the last round. We got second. We didn't win, but that's okay. Uh, we made a lot of great friends and like everyone we competed with was so cool. Like outside of the show, we hung up, like hung up, <laughs> we hung out, we went out, we got drinks, we celebrated after our taping. It was a great time. And all of them are just, they're all amazing ladies and, you know, they're all doing their things and they're all successful and like I'm, I still root to it for them to this day because I'm like, look at y'all, like, praise. <laughs> do you ever, do you ever keep in contact with anybody from the show still? Um, the person I keep in contact most with was um, the girl who was on the winning team. Her name is Caitlin, and she had the brown hair. Right. Um, she works for Duff Goldman now at Charm City Cakes in Boston. So you know, she went right up Damn. and over. That. Yeah. Yeah. And she messages us, us all the time and she was just on another show too. So she she's the one we hear from most frequently. But like, you know, we like all of each other's pictures on Instagram, on Facebook and all of that. Um, they're all so talented. Taylor started her own business and, you know, we're all like, we're the Sugar Rush squad now. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so I, I did see the the episode, and it was it was really cool and interesting, and um, I I don't know, I'm not too not too bad about the other contestants because you said they were really nice and good and everything, but I was just like that last episode, I was because uh, I felt like you y'all had a sweater and they didn't. <laughs> Yeah. I was just like, but well, that that's a sweater. There there isn't a sweater. You know, did you did you feel that way? Like when the uh judges were like, okay, you know what I mean? When they were judging? Um no. <laughs> okay. I thought there yeah. Um I have a pretty strong opinion on this particular subject because I've heard this quite a bit. Oh, here we go, <laughs> okay. The amount of work those two girls put into their cake in the amount of time that we had was none less than like a seller fee. Mm -hmm. Chris and I, um, we, I feel like our flavor was better. I will say that we came up with the whole San Antonio hot chocolate thing and the plaid thing, which is really cool. But we had structural issues and baking issues. So we literally decorated our cake with 15 minutes left to spare. And that was just pretty much rolling fondant out as quickly as we could to throw it on a cake <laughs> right. cookie cutters and just started slapping things on okay they they sculpted they baked cookies they made cake balls they had you know this huge tiered cake they did fondant textures on the side so i think what it came down to the judges was the amount of work put in during that round Right. And I think that's what it really came out to. And they did consistently well throughout the competition. Why, you know, Chris and I had our ups and downs, mainly due to me. I'll take responsibility <laughs> for that. <laughs> but um, I I did not disagree with that. I do agree our, we had an ugly sweater case. <laughs> but, she, she wasn't pretty, but um, I just think, based off of technical skill when you get into people like Zumbo and Candice who, you know, do what I do for a living, that right. counts for something. You know, Eliza, you know, she represent in Texas with us because, you know, she's from Houston and yeah. she she was familiar with all those flavors and everything. But, you know, she 
she's not a baker at the end of the day, but she's a great cake eater. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> she, she put away some dessert. <laughs> so. so on the on the show, you guys did a champagne cupcake. Uh, yeah. Why did you and Chris decide to, to do the champagne cupcake in the first place? So that first round, the challenge was to make a cupcake that was a Christmas spirit cupcake, which means we needed to do some sort of you know, Christmas flavored cocktail. And right. um, we were pretty sure everyone was going to do like bourbon eggnog and, you know, like mold cider and mold wine and, you know, all the classic drinks. So we wanted to think on more of an international scale because in France, they celebrate, they celebrate Les Revillons, which is the celebration of the new year or like the new times or, you know, Jesus's birth, just kind of like it is here. Right. And like, they have a whole other culture going on that isn't just Christmas, but it's very like Christmas. So right. we wanted to differentiate by bringing those things to light with, you know, more of a Texas twist. <laughs> so, which is why we got dinged for a jello shot in the middle of our cupcake, because... <laughs> Yeah. Um, but you know, that goes back to my French heritage. I was like, oh, France Cur Royale, let's do it. That's black currant and champagne. That's not familiar. It's something new. It won't be heavy, it won't be laden with cinnamon. And, you know, we had talked about balancing out the actual filling with some sort of like jam or puree, and we really should have went with our well, I Chris suggested it, and I was like, no, we'll be fine, and I was, I should have listened, <laughs> because I was like, they need to taste the burn of the alcohol, and that's what, that's what we had in our cupcake, and it was, it was too much. It was a little bit, just a little bit too much alcohol, maybe. Yeah, um, we used a whole bottle of champagne and half a bottle of creme de cassis, which is a black currant liqueur from France, and yeah, for you know, twelve cupcakes. That's a lot of liquor. <laughs> I feel like that's dangerous. Like the the black currant um, liqueur. I, I feel like that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> you get the burn from the alcohol. You want to stay away from elderflower liqueur. That it's just sweet and it's good. And then and then you're you passed can, out. <laughs> you slur. You're, no, you're talking in cursive. That's what it is. I never. You're slur. talking in cursive. <laughs> 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 oh, that's great. Yeah. Oh, man. So after oh. after the loss, I'm assuming so and hopefully, but they still pay for your trip back, yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. Right? Yeah. They they pretty much pay for everything. Like you're there to essentially be like the stars, the entertainers of the show. So you get that celebrity treatment. Every room that we were ever brought into was full of snacks. If you wanted it, it was there. You want a Skittles, they have Skittles. You want a Snicker, they got a Snicker. You want Cheetos, they have four kinds. Which one you want? Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> There's snacks on snacks on snacks. And then they're like, you all hungry? We have food upstairs, come on. And it's like, we get to eat again. <laughs> Jeez, that sounds so awesome. <laughs> yeah so and you know they they drive you pretty much everywhere too like they drove us to the airport they picked us up from the airport they took us to our hotel they took us to the studio pretty much anything that wasn't on our time they drove us to yeah wow, so, wow. Like, that's pretty awesome it, it was nice <laughs> behind the scenes so could you tell us like i know uh in on the Netflix show, it's like 45 minutes or whatever, and they say, you know, you get, uh, I think it was, what was it, like three hours or something, right? Four hours. Four hours? Four. So are they filming that entire four hours and then just deciding what to use, or are there certain areas where they're coming in and they're like, okay, well, we're going to film now, or? No. They filmed us from the time we started till the time we ended. Oh, wow. So okay. And uh, you have a microphone on you the entire time. So if you think that they can't hear you, they can. <laughs> 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 because at one point I was sitting over there um, with the eggs and I was just whisking. I was like, these things will not get to where they need to be. And they're like, Shh. 
don't do that. And I was like, oh, oh that's right. They can hear me. But they they showed the exciting parts for a reason because they were to show us from start to finish what we were doing. You would see a lot of us just being kind of silent, mixing things, throwing things into the oven, pulling things out, yeah. a lot of mixing noise. So as each one of the teams kind of had like their own producer almost, and they would stand there and, you know, they would ask us stuff occasionally, or if we weren't talking enough to the other team, they'd be like, could you say something to them? Um, the team that we were across from were Caitlin and Sabrina, and, you know, we keep keep the entire time, so that was good. And then the other two teams were across, like, the studio from us, so we would literally have to yell. So yeah, we didn't really talk to them just because it. I don't think they would have been able to hear us. <laughs> right, that makes sense. Um, but they write down certain things that happen or certain things that you say, and then when you go in for your exit interview, they ask you about, well, why did you say this? Why do you do it this way? Because at one point I was like, oh, I'm going to measure this like grandma with my heart. And they're like, what does that mean? And I was like, that just means whenever your heart says stop, you stop. So if it ends up being, you know, a whole bottle of vanilla, that's that's what it needed. <laughs> and she was like, oh. And I was like, it's how grandma measures. A pinch of this, a dash of that, a yeah. handful of this is done. <laughs> uh, was there anything in the unedited version that you wished made it to the edited version? Um... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's like, no, we'll keep all that on secret. <laughs> yeah. Well, if the truth be told, I cried at the end of the show and they cut that out and I was like, thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh. yeah. You know, when they were asking us everything, the like the title was like what meant the most to me because in my profession, because I'm not classically trained and I don't have a degree, I've often faced a lot of ridicule from other chefs that do I've been called a fake chef and I was told I would never amount to much and that you know I was nothing but a line cook and all of these Ooh. other degrading things because I didn't have a piece of paper that stated that I knew how to bake and cook yeah so the title was kind of like that for me and I was trying to explain that but it just made me so emotional because one of my life goals was to be on a tv show by the time I was 30 and I got on one when I was 28 so I was like, <laughs> right right yeah. and I was like I'm in the right path I'm doing the right things I've made the right choices for my life and for my career so and it all hit me right there and I was like hold it together bitch hold it together <laughs> <laughs> so and then you know Caitlin also came over and like she gave me a hug and she's like I'm so sorry that all that happened and I was like thank you and she goes it means nothing look at you now and I was like thank you and you know, Chris and everyone there was very, very reassuring. They're like, you're self-taught. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, and I was like, one, I don't have a life. I literally bake and cook all day, <laughs> every day, seven days a week, 365 yeah. a year. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it was a really gratifying moment. So it made me very emotional. And I'm, I don't view myself as a very emotional person unless it's sass. So... <laughs> <laughs> but you know it was good it, it felt nice to finally achieve something and even if we didn't win we got second place out of thousands of people who auditioned for this show and that has to count for something you know yeah, yeah. For real. and you know I 100% I'm going to do another show I just got to get on one first Ooh. yeah any yeah. chefs or pastry chefs out there that want Richard Skaggs on their show <laughs> let them know <laughs> <laughs> so uh what would you have done differently on the show or would you have done anything differently at all um i would have done a few things differently one um i would have brought my own equipment <laughs> 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 because that really did make a difference um they actually bought those little domes for us that we did our second round dessert in. And I was so confident they would work because I have the same ones at my house and yeah. they work. So I was like, of course they'll work. And then they didn't work. They ended up suction, 
like it suction cupped into the actual sphere so we couldn't oh. pull them out them breaking because the whole point of tempering chocolate like that is to get it as thin as possible so it cracks really satisfyingly and yeah. you don't have to essentially take like a sledgehammer to get to the dessert and right. they suction cup so you know we I was like okay well we have these rubber molds which make everything dull and then you know I was trying to make the chocolate set faster because of that and I threw it in the blast chiller for like two seconds and it said it too much and I was like Ooh. <sighs> and I would have added black currant jelly or puree or something into you know the feeling like everyone was like you should do that and I was like no they have to taste the alcohol <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I really wish they would have shown on the show like if I could change that was in the third round the suction cup chocolate spheres started popping out in the third round like they just started coming out like it was nothing and I was like what treachery is this <laughs> so, and I literally said that and I was like I hope they show that so everyone knows I can temper chocolate <laughs> uh, <laughs> being shady and she was like no I like living in this film I ain't coming out and then you know third round she's like hey it's like <laughs> the, show the creations you're most proud of like top two what do you what do you got I that's a loaded question because I made <laughs> I mean looking looking at your Facebook and your Instagram pictures of the cakes and pastries you've made and just in like the last couple months, like dude, they're amazing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> like for really real. Awesome. They really are. I wish I could hire you every day to just make <laughs> my desserts. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> um I get I'll go with what I consider two Richard Skaggs originals. I haven't seen these anywhere else, and I guess that's that's what I'll have to use for uh, my answer. I've been working on a tart for a while now, and it's the Apple Queen tart, and it's the tart that has all the beautiful apples that are arranged in roses on top of it. Yeah. And, like, I just, I love the idea of this tart so much, and I'm trying to perfect it so it has like a full body like reaction to it because that's what I want with this tart. I want it to hit you aromatically, texturally. Like I want the flavors to explode in your mouth. Essentially a food gasm is what I want. That's okay. My... <laughs> <laughs> so, and this tart is a kind of a combination of my love of pastry with my love of gardening, with my love of science because apples and roses are actually in the same family. Like, they're in that they're in a family together so they go together in my mind right. and you know in France especially in Normandy apples are a huge thing and I was like let's highlight this so like the crust is a brown sugar sable and then in that there's a cream de monde layer which is kind of like a lighter frangipan it's almost cakey and I soak that with calvados and simple syrup and calvados is a special apple brandy liqueur from France and then on top of that, I do a very light rose Tahitian uh, pastry cream, just so the essence of the rose kind of brings out the apples just a little bit more without it over, you know, powering or coating your palate. So it feels like, you know, you're eating grandma's perfume. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I use five different apple varietals because I, apples should be celebrated in the diversity, especially when it comes to color, texture, and flavor. And I wanted to highlight that as well. Um, and this actually happened when I was in the apple section in the grocery store, is I noticed all these beautiful colors. And I'm like, how come we never highlight the skin of the apple? And that's kind of where this tart started at. Oh, so, oh neat. Um, right. And the apples are poached. And the red mixture on the apples actually dyes the apples red because there's dried beetroot and there's freeze dried cherries and like 14 other things that I won't bore you guys with. But I put <laughs> two apples in there and I slice them so thin that you can almost see through them. And then I just throw them in the hot liquid and let them sit overnight. That way the apple doesn't overcook or discolor too much. And I can still highlight that beautiful part of the rind. Uh, well, not the rind, the skin. 
And then with my lighter apples, like the Golden Opal and the Granny Smith and Honeycrisp, I poach in this super, super strong concentration of ginger and cardamom and elderflower liqueur and Tahitian vanilla bean. And now it, the contrast just highlights apples different and then glazing it gives it that like final look. And cause she's the queen, no. so uh -huh. she gets gold leaf. So, <laughs> oh man, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very complex time thing, but it like a part of me is with this creation, and I've made it seven times now, and it gets a little better each time I make it. And I actually made it earlier this week, and it went from a seven to like a high eight and a half, in my opinion. Ooh, okay, it still yeah. has some technical flaws with it, but it started off as a two. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> so, I'm gonna be number ten. Yeah, sooner <laughs> or later. What is your uh? Your second favorite. So that was your first, or is that, yeah? That's my first favorite. And my second favorite, I'm fairly sure you guys have tried. Um, do you remember the white chocolate sage mesquite honey macarons that I made? Yeah. Uh, yes. That is another combination that I have not seen anywhere else. So I'm going to take ownership of that. All right. But, you know, sage is a great plant it's my favorite herb and I don't feel like people utilize it enough and it can go between savory and sweet you just have to know how to work with it and how to balance it and honey and mesquite help balance out that earthy astringency that comes with it while yeah. you're just left with that Ooh, what is that? So <laughs> adding in the white chocolate brings in the sweetness so you don't feel like it's savory. And, you know, it's just, I was like, I love the idea. I tested it out a couple of times to find out what would balance it beautifully. And it turned out to be mesquite powder and honey. And I was like, that's crazy. How, how long did it take you to get the... Uh... The mesquite and honey, like, how did you figure that was the direction that would help the sage um, undertones, like, not come out as much? So, the mesquite was by accident, if we're being honest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the honey was more of a hunch, because honey is an invert sugar, but it has, like, that floral taste to it. And I know honeybees can just pollinate lavender fields, or they can just... Uh, pollinate rosemary fields and the honey takes on that quality so I was hoping by using Texas sage and well say sage that was grown in Texas and then local Texas honey that it would help balance it out white so I wouldn't have to use so much white chocolate to get sweetness I could cut back out on it and then right. my boyfriend was messing with mesquite powder to do god knows what <laughs> it fell into the ganache. Oh, wow, and, what? <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. yeah, and it got mixed in, and I was tasting it, and I was like, oh, this is good. He's and like, shut like, up, whatever. <laughs> so it was a happy accident, and I was like, you did good this time. I'm not angry. This is great. <laughs> That's awesome. So, That's really cool. you know, it was a nice little collaboration by accident. I feel like... Um... A lot of people know you for your baking, for all of, like everything you do in that world. But how about like uh, like uh, cooking? Like what are, what is your favorite thing to cook? Not bake. I Hold know. on, before you say anything, let me get my dictionary so I can understand what you're about to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually do have a signature dish. Okay. All right, what is it? So, it's called Fruit de Canard, and it is a French dish. And what that translates into is the duck forest. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the duck, the duck forest. is my favorite, like, protein of all time. It's rich. It's meaty. It's everything that I want. It's got crispy skin because my retirement plan is to become a circle with eyes from eating crispy poultry skin. <laughs> uh, but... So I just do the duck very, very simply. I score the skin, salt, pepper, and then I cook it, you know, fat side down, which is the skin side, um, because duck has a lot of fat in it, but it's all in the skin. And then the protein 
uh, part of it, the actual meat part of it, you don't want to be like cooked all the way through like with chicken. You kind of want it to have a rosy pinkness to it because that's that's what makes it tender. If you start venturing into like the 165 Fahrenheit range, duck gets very dry and very chewy and it you, you kind of disrespect it in a way. Right. So I like to just let the duck be the duck. And then on that plate, um, I make um, a paviard sauce, which is a pepper sauce. And it takes about eight hours to make. There's a lot of reduction time. It has a oh, full geez. bottle of red wine in it. It's got uh, red currants. It's got cherries. It's got um, blackberries in it, which are all classic pairings of duck, just to intensify and deepen like that flavor. And it's also a sauce that you use most on wild game, which duck is considered. And then I do fondant potatoes, which are Oh, yeah. Have you had them before? Yeah, I love those. So I do three fondant potatoes with grilled broccolini. And then that's just, that's all it needs. It's a oh great. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a three root puree on it, too. And it's um, rutabaga, celery root, and parsnip. Right. I just do a nice puree of that with the duck and then the potatoes and the broccoli and it's the sauce. It's, it's a beautiful bite together. That, <laughs> that sounds, sounds amazing. Great. Sounds so good. Yeah. <laughs> I just I ate, man. Do what you doing? <laughs> yeah. My boyfriend eats real good. <laughs> I I a ring on it. <laughs> <laughs> do y'all uh, share in the cooking? Like, it, is one of you the better cook or... Oh, he doesn't. Uh, yeah, oh, me. He... <laughs> <laughs> like, don't, don't get me wrong. He can cook, but he he tries to kind of veer into my lane of like fine dining, you know, complicated things. And I'm like, you need to stop. You have no <laughs> idea what you're doing. Oh, <laughs> like, I, I feel, help like, you I feel you like you're can... only saying this because he's not there with you right now. No, I've said all this to his face. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> you know, I don't sugarcoat things because that's what I do in my profession. I got Oh yeah. Things, you know. <laughs> so, but he has made some of the best food I've eaten, but he's also responsible for the worst food I've ever eaten. Oh man. <laughs> um he he's really good at frying and grilling and roasting things. So, and deer, steak, chicken, pork, you know, your run-of-the-mill things, he's really good with. And he grew up in the country, so he knows how to cook some weirder things. He's <laughs> like, try squirrel and dumplings. And I'm like, I ain't eat no tree rat, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we try not to cook together because I can literally hear him cutting wrong from the other room and it annoys the crap out of him. Oh, jeez. I'm like, you shouldn't do that that way. Oh, excuse me. You shouldn't do it that way. So <laughs> and he's like, Richard. And I'm like, sorry, you're nice and still. Don't want you to cut your finger. <laughs> <laughs> so are you trying to own your own bakery? And on top of that, if you owned your own bakery, what would it be called? So I actually have a plan to open up three businesses here. All right. So wow. um, I want to open up a bakery cafe called Bake My Day because. Nice. There you go. It's yeah. cute, it's funny, it's me. Um, and that has been in the works since about my first year in the pastry world. I was like, I need to open up my own bakery. I have so many ideas that I want to share with people. So um, that's been like the longest running one so far. And then I want to open up a, um, a chef store that is about custom seasoning blends and fresh herbs and how to use spices and the science behind why things work together that they do. But I want to call it the chef's apothecary and sell everything in glass bottles with corks because there's something so charming about that. And there's nowhere that does that. And right. then I want to open up a fine dining restaurant that is all about fine dining French food. And I'm going to call it saute. So like the best words of wisdom that I could give you from my personal experiences, both in the culinary world and in my personal life is one, if it makes you feel like you might fail, you should go ahead and do it because the worst <laughs> that could happen is you could fail. The experiences and the knowledge that you gain from every failure could be your greatest weapon. 
because from that comes understanding and learning. And, you know, the light bulb wasn't made in a day. There's 99 ways how not to do that. So take that chance, go for that opportunity and really see where it takes you. Because if it scares you, it could be the best thing for you. And I've struggled with that a lot. But once I started taking those chances that really scared me is when everything started coming together for me, you know, pretty much in my entire life, both personal and professional. Where, uh, where can people find you? Can they, can they contact you? Also, if people do contact you for like a cake or something, are you local only or what's, what's your range? <laughs> um, I mainly work off of my Instagram and my Facebook whenever people need desserts. I do hold down a full-time job, but I put a lot of effort into the creations that I make for people's special events because, you know, I want that personal you know, feel with everything that I do. Yeah. So I take orders through my Instagram page as well as Facebook and, you know, as well as I hand out business cards as well. So oh, anytime okay. you really need a dessert, just, you know, shoot me a message and, you know, I'll drive up to an hour away to deliver something to you. <laughs> That's legit. Um, yeah. If you're looking for me on Facebook, you can just type in my name, which is Richard Skaggs, S-K-G-G-S. And you can find me there, or my Instagram handle is rcskags3300, um, and I'm on there pretty much all the time. So just, if you need anything, shoot me a message. Thanks for checking out the fifth episode of Spaghetti at My House. Don't forget to check out the links in the description.